from the headquarters of Telesio English in Quito, Ecuador. This is from the South, and I am Suini Gray. Delegates from Venezuela's government and the opposition have arrived in the Dominican Republic, where they're set to share another round of talks. Both parties met, last met on January 15th and were close to an agreement on seven topics to overcome the political and economic conflict in the country. The dialogue comes as the country prepares for presidential elections in the next three months. This is the first meeting since Venezuela's National Constituent Assembly called for a presidential election, a move opposed by the opposition. Madeleine Garcia takes a look at the challenges faced by both sides. Venezuela's government and the opposition are meeting again in Santo Domingo to talk. The Dominican Republic's president, Danilo Medina, confirmed it. Both parts agreed that they would meet on January 29th. If either of the parts don't come, that is their own decision. This time, the delegates from both parties will review what they agreed on January 15th at their last meeting. But the new sanctions imposed on seven Venezuelan officials threaten the dialogue process, especially as the government and the opposition were trying to agree to reject such measures. At the same time, the National Constituent Assembly has called for a presidential election before April 30th. This announcement was rejected by the opposition, even though they had been demanding a new presidential election. Today we will have a new dialogue round with the opposition. Just two weeks ago, we were close to signing an agreement that touched on seven issues. As president, I tell you we are ready to sign an agreement with the opposition so that we can coexist and have a continuous dialogue to ensure peace. I hope the opposition can really engage in dialogue and negotiate. I am ready. I'm a man open to dialogue, a man of my word. The Supreme Court has ordered the National Electoral Council not to allow the Mood coalition to register again as a party, on the grounds that the opposition parties that make up the coalition have not dissolved and is not allowed to be a member of two parties at the same time. Luis Florido, a lawmaker from the Voluntad Popular Party, will not attend the meeting in Santo Domingo. He said he made this decision after he was allegedly excluded from the electoral process, but his party didn't register as other opposition groups did, including Democratic Action and Justice First, respecting the decree from the National Constituent Assembly. Mexico has decided not to take part as an observer in the new round of talks, saying it has rejected the Assembly's decision to call for elections. In response, Venezuela said that those who support the opposition condemn the government and applaud when people are killed. For their part, the representatives of the Dominican government are hopeful that an agreement will be reached. The United Nations has expressed its support for continued dialogue between Venezuela's government and the opposition. Farhan Haq, deputy spokesperson for the Secretary General, was asked about some countries saying they may not recognize the upcoming presidential election in Venezuela. Farhan, on Venezuela, in this the early elections that have been called, some countries are saying they won't uh, recognize the results of uh, these presidential elections. What is the position of the Secretary General? We are aware of uh, what the various parties, uh, including the government and the opposition, have been saying about uh, the early elections. Uh, meanwhile, we continue to support the regional efforts, particularly those led by the Dominican Republic, and we hope that the government and the opposition will be able to reach a much needed agreement. Uh, as you know, the Secretary General has repeatedly expressed concern with unilateral measures that may distance Venezuela from a path conducive to agreed political solutions uh, to its challenges. And we do believe that there's still avenues for the government and the opposition to reach compromise on critical issues. And our correspondent, Madeline Garcia, sent this update from Santo Domingo. The Venezuelan opposition delegation compromising of seven members, including their leader, Julio Borges, arrived in the Dominican Republic. The foreign ministers from Bolivia, Nicaragua, Dominican Republic, the Chilean ambassador and former Spanish president, Jose Luis Rodriguez Zapatero, have also arrived. We are waiting for the Venezuelan government delegation, led by the communications minister, Jorge Rodriguez. Earlier today, former Spanish President José Luis Rodríguez Zapatero said that there is a lot of optimism towards the peace dialogues. There are several topics to be discussed in the second round of talks. The electoral process, the sanctions against Venezuela, the National Assembly, democratic decisions, and more.
A few days ago, the National Constituent Assembly announced that the presidential elections will be held before April 30, 2018. This decision has been rejected by the opposition coalition. This will be the first point to be discussed today at the peace talks. Venezuelan President Nicolás Maduro said that his government is willing to sign any peace agreement with the opposition coalition to resolve any conflict and bring peace for Venezuelan people. We thank Madeleine Garcia for that report. The Venezuelan government has rejected what it considers unacceptable statements by French President Emmanuel Macron indicating support for increased European Union sanctions against Venezuela. Macron's comments were a hostile and unfriendly act by the leader of a nat nation with which Venezuela has cultivated historical and brotherly ties, the foreign ministry statement said. To Honduras now, where opposition supporters held a candlelight vigil on Sunday night against what they call a di dictatorship after the swearing in of President Juan Orlando Hernandez for a second term. The protesters gathered outside the embassy of the United States, who they accused of helping to install President Hernandez, despite widespread fraud in November's election. More than 30 protesters have been killed by the police and military since the election. The killing and crimes against our brothers and sisters after November 26, up to now, are the responsibility of Juan Orlando Hernandez and his team, but are also the direct responsibility of the government of the United States. I'm here as part of a religious delegation. There are over 50 of us who have come from the United States and other countries to accompany the Honduran people at this time of heavy violence as they protest electoral fraud here in the country. Saturday's swearing in of Juan Orlando Hernandez was the first time in over 30 years that a Honduran president has taken the oath for a second consecutive term, something the opposition regards as unconstitutional. In the middle of ongoing opposition protests, signs of electoral fraud, absence of officials, and strict security measures, Juan Orlando Hernandez has been sworn in as president of Honduras. I am aware that there are political differences. Of course, we acknowledge them. But we need to talk about these differences because... The president has now been labeled a dictator by many for breaking the law in the re-election process, which ended with heavy repression of peaceful protesters. We have encountered military with rifles. The rifles are for the war. I know that war is a business, and the countries that sell arms need to sell them so the business continue. This will probably cause a civil war in Honduras between the thieves and the Honduran people. Tegucigalpa, Honduras's capital, turned into a pitched battle, the military using all of its force to keep the demonstrators away from the president's swearing-in ceremony. We only walked a block and they started to repress us. There were children, elderly, but that was the dictator's order, to not let us protest peacefully. There was no consideration for anyone as police threw tear gas into all places where there were any demonstrators. They don't respect the press. They don't respect human rights organizations. As you can see, your colleague is wounded. Police and military actions were really strong. The opposition promise was to maintain the protests until agreements with real international mediators are achieved. We know that they're prepared to kill, but Juan Orlando Hernandez should know that he has to kill me to stop me from protesting. Members of the opposition plan to continue to use their right to stand against the re-election, just as the Constitution says when an illegal government takes oath. We take a short break now. Join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting on. O de los señalamientos o de lo que se dice a veces en las redes sociales que a veces son muy irritantes y a veces les gusta ser señalamientos muy duros y muy lapidarios y que poco recogen de los dobles. Porque ven, realmente ven lo que México ha venido alcanzando en cifras, en números, en estadísticas, en realidad. Y advierten que México...
Welcome back. Costa Ricans will vote for a new president next Sunday, and the campaign has taken an unexpected turn with conservative groups debating LGBTI rights. More details in the next report. A revival of the debate regarding the LGBTI rights heated the electoral campaign in Costa Rica. Opposition to diversity has boosted conservative candidates. It's dangerous, it's religious opportunism. Every cult, every Sunday meeting has been like a candidacy rally. This is something that goes against the rules of the Supreme Electoral Tribunal. The debate regarding human rights has taken over the electoral discussion. Anti-rights rhetoric from religious forums has polarized the population. These churches, especially the Pentecostal, indoctrinate the people, and I'm not saying Catholics aren't also guilty, because there is also indoctrination from their puppets. The electoral dispute has also given rise to some hate speech. It's worrying the tone that some of these groups are using in the electoral campaign to try to use the discontent that exists after the resolution of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Speaking of this debate, human rights activists warn about the double standards that propose some rights for only some people. This simply should not exist because justice and human rights must be a given in Costa Rica and in the world. And Costa Rica has always said that human rights are important, and now these groups are saying they aren't. The Supreme Electoral Tribunal called all the churches of all denominations to stop carrying out political divisions. Let us not lose this valuable opportunity that democracy gives us to discuss reasonably about vital problems and try to find a solution together. With just one week left to the elections, the polls show that the voters haven't decided yet which of the 13 options could be the two that advance to the second round. Cuban President Raul Castro has led the traditional March of the Torches to commemorate the 165th anniversary of the birth of Cuban national hero Jose Marti. The ceremony saw the unveiling of a replica of a statue that stands in New York Central Park, the only bronze statue of Marti in existence. The gift was made possible with funding from the Bronx Museum of the Arts and comes as President Donald Trump has tightened the U.S. blockade against Cuba. The iconic statue of the Cuban patriot and author, Jose Marti, that stands in Central Park, has been a source of inspiration and empowerment for generations of Cuban New Yorkers. And today, unveiling of a reproduction in Havana not only commemorates the 165th anniversary of Marti's birth, but also ensures that his story legacy of pursuing independence will be shared with new generation. I think we're going to have to wait a little bit with President Trump. I do not think anything will happen in his first period. If he has a second one, I think it's going to be more difficult. We're going through a difficult time. What was achieved, we still have. It has not been reversed, but we must wait. Cuba lights up with fire. Just like 65 years ago, the torches are in the hands of the young people. In 1953, Fidel Castro and the generation known as the Generation of the Centennial led this march for a free Cuba. Today, the challenge is to preserve the independence of the island. We are still doing the march, and it is a sign that the revolution is still here and that there are more young people in it. So we are really happy and proud out of it. The first of these torches was lit in the Santa Efigenia Cemetery in Santiago de Cuba, where the eternal flame burns in tribute to the independence heroes Carlos Manuel de Cespedes, Jorge Martí, and Mariana Grajales, and the leader of the Cuban Revolution, Fidel Castro. Since then, the flame has passed through 168 municipalities of the island, with young people of diverse sectors of Cuban society. The young Cuban generation today is committed to our country, to our destiny and our socialism. Cuban youth is not a change, it's a continuity. We have always been part of this revolution. The assistance to the first international meeting of the Marti Young Followers joined the March of the Torches. They are in Cuba to debate on the ideas of Jose Marti in the current international context. For us Venezuelans, it means a lot to always be supporting this strong and sovereign country. 
Cuba our sister country. It's a country that never leaves us and it's always there for us under any difficult situation. Viva Cuba, viva Venezuela, viva Latin America United. This Argentine married couple on tourism in Cuba waited for three hours to see the march of the torches in Havana. I think there are a lot of people and that this event is real alive. I see a lot of happy people with so much joy. It's not a mandatory march. They're doing it because they want to. The March of the Torches is happening as the U.S. administration is increasing their hostility towards Cuba. According to the University Student Federation president, Raul Palmero, this is why Cuba needs unity and profound anti-imperialism, now more than ever. The 17-year-old Mexican student, Marco Antonio Sanchez, was found alive after being taken on January 23rd by the police. Our correspondent, Pablo Perez, has the latest. For over 120 hours, there were no news about the whereabouts of young student Marco Antonio Sanchez Flores, who disappeared on the 23rd of January after being detained by the Mexico City Police. The official report says, says that the police officers uh, arrested him under accusation for, of robbery, an accusation that was never concreted because the accusatory part never presented itself. And they say they released him just a couple of blocks ahead, but the problem is that Marco Antonio is a minor, so they cannot release him, but under the supervision of his parents or a responsible adult. Well, he was badly beaten, and that was the, rec the recollection of a witness, a friend of Marco Antonio. He was badly beaten by the police officers and took into a uh, uh, an official car, uh, a patrol car, and taken to the uh, uh, commissary of Azcapotzalco, which was not true. He was not in the commissary of Azcapotzalco. Three days later, he seen, he appeared on the uh, video record, the CCTV of a uh, uh, police station in Tlalnepantla, in the state of Mexico, which is another jurisdiction totally. And uh, by that, by then, the parents and the media and the or, uh, human rights organization were all on alert. There was an, um, a, ma a number alert because he's a minor, uh, looking for Marco Antonio everywhere. And it, it, this led to a presentation by the, uh, the governor of Mexico City, Miguel Angel Mancera, who said that they were doing all efforts to locate the young man that had disappeared. And uh, also, the organization calling this a uh, forced disappearance. It means that the authorities led to the disappearance of Marco Antonio. Finally, he uh, he was found yesterday in the state of Mexico, uh, over uh, 20, 25 miles away, where he was detained. He was badly beating. He was really confused, and he is. Uh, in a poor state of health. There is still, uh, the, the, his attorney says that he cannot declare yet because of his state of mind, he is really confused, and there is still a lot to be resolved, but what we can uh, take in uh, account right now is that the Human Rights Commission of the Mexico City says that it was a, it was a forced disappearance when the case started, and even after he uh, was found, it's still a forced disappearance. A disappearance with the participation of the police of Mexico City. We thank Pablo Perez for that report. Final drills have taken place in Ecuador ahead of the referendum coming up on February 4th. In all 24 provinces of the Andean nation, authorities of the National Electoral Council tested all the techniques and logistics, the procedures and the documentation to be used in the voting process. The former president of Brazil, Lula da Silva, was prevented from traveling to Ethiopia to take part in the African Union con conference after a judge confiscated his passport. But that didn't stop him from helping the fight against hunger in Africa. I want to tell you that hunger in the world today is not a matter of lack of food because the world produced more than enough. Hunger in the world today is the consequence of the lack of money destined to poorest people in the world. Money isn't short either. We see billions of dollars that are traded around the world. 
Now, the, Caribbean, uh, the music of the Caribbean and Latin America has a lot of similarities, but surprisingly, Caribbean music isn't very popular in Latin America, and vice versa. But there's one band from Trinidad and Tobago that's trying to change that. Kesteban recently played in the Colombian island of San Andreas. Let's listen to them. And we talked to the lead singer of Kes, the band, soca artist Kes Defantala, about intra-regional music and cultural partnerships. People had such a good time. They, they really knew only two songs. And other than that, they just enjoyed the music and enjoyed the vibe, you know? Um, I think we have a lot in similar uh, between, between the, the language barriers. The, the music is the same, the feel, uh, it, it, the energy. We, are all, we all celebrate music in a very similar way, so um, it was a great experience. And we'll take a short break now. Join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting on. Welcome back. The death toll from Saturday's massive bombing attack in Kabul has risen to 103, with another 235 wounded, the Afghan Interior Ministry said on Sunday. The deadly blast claimed by the Taliban occurred around 12.50 Saturday afternoon in a crowded area in the Afghan capital, where several government offices are located. Two ambulances were used in Saturday's attack. One of them was used as cover so the second could get through the checkpoint. Afghan security forces have so far arrested four suspects. And now let's have a look at some other news, making headlines from around the world. Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny has been freed after detained by police at a Moscow rally in support of a presidential election boycott. He was dragged roughly by police into a bus shortly after he arrived at the demonstration in Moscow. The police said Navalny, who has been barred from taking part in the March 18th vote, was detained for organizing the unsanctioned rally. Thousands of protesters marched through central Paris to condemn the Turkish military operations against Kurdish militia in Afrin's northern Syria. The demonstrators urged French and other Western authorities to take a tougher stand against the Turkish campaign. Violence has escalated in northern Syria in recent days as Turkish forces have targeted the city of Afrin and threatened to push further east toward the border with Iraq. What we want is a political solution. What we want is the international community acting on its side, the United Nations and especially France, which has a very important position in Syria, to act on its side so that the bombing stops. The 30th African Union Summit has been launched in Addis Ababa on Sunday with calls for a continental free trade area and a focus on reforming the organization. Leaders signaled the urgency to combat militant attacks that have become a major threat to peace, security and development. The two-day summit's theme is winning the fight against corruption, a sustainable path to Africa's transformation. U.S.-based online fitness tracker Strava has published a heat map showing the parts its users take as they run or cycle. Now, although the map was published last November, security concerns were raised after a 20-year-old Australian student posted the map from Strava on Twitter on Saturday, pointing out it clears, clearly shows the U.S. military bases 
and the exercise routes of military personnel from around the world. And we've come to the end of this news brief for these and many other stories. You can find them on our website at tellusyourtv.net forward slash English. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But tell us your English. I am Sweeney Gray. Thank you so much for watching. Community organization and revolutionary verse views in Any Don't Stop. A window to urban culture and political resistance conducted by the hip hop band Rebel Deer. Any Don't Stop, Fridays, only on Telesur.